Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bunga Cast. My name is Alex Hochuli. It's Friday, the 4th of March, and George Orr and Philip Cunliffe are here as usual. Hello. Hey. Yo. So uh, today we are going to be talking to, or very specifically, uh, you'll be listening to an interview that I conducted with Vivek Chibber. If you don't know Vivek, he's professor of sociology at NYU. He's the editor of Catalyst, uh, which is a journal of theory and strategy published by Jacobin Magazine, and the author of several books. I'll just cite a couple, Locked in Place, which is on state building and late industrialization, uh, post-colonial theory and the specter of capital, but uh, we are going to be dedicating most of the time to discussing his new book, The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn, which is out just recently and uh, strongly recommended. So uh, what you're going to hear now is me interviewing Vivek Chibber, at least most of it, that's a free episode, and then uh, the rest of the interview will be out on Patreon, that patreon.com slash bungacast, followed by our after party, where the three of us will discuss a little bit and unpick what we've just heard. Catch you on the other side. So I'm here in New York with Vivek Chibber. I'm very delighted uh, that he would have me. Um, And you were just telling me now about uh, that sometimes you lecture for eight hours a day. Yeah. um, Friends and comrades and I in India, we have this uh, school prior to COVID. We'd done it for, I think, seven years, twice a year. And it's a school for Marxism. And the participants would come from all over the country, normally about uh, 50 people uh, at a time. And it would run for four days at a time. And the sessions went from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. with the possibility of an additional session if people asked for it. And on the days that I lectured, um, I would do three-hour modules. And and if we went after the 6 p.m. slot, it would go to 9 p.m. So 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., I would lecture about seven hours a day. Wow. And the, and the, and the students would sit through that, I mean, those attending. Yeah. Well, first of all, these were all militants, uh, union organizers, party people from various organizations. So they do have a certain discipline uh, uh, and a seriousness, which mm. is largely missing on the American left. Yeah. Um, and because the Indian left has largely, almost entirely given up on education, uh, they were very keen and very eager. And, you know, there was a lot of talking that I did, but then there was quite intense engagement on their part, part, trying to relate their concrete organizing experiences to the more abstract theory that I was laying out. So uh, they were excited about that. Um, And it's an extraordinary experience because these schools are uh, sleepaway schools and they're in a compound where nobody leaves for four days. And since they're all from different political parties, it also became a way informally after the sessions for them to have political discussions and negotiations amongst themselves. That's that's fantastic. I, I uh, yeah, I would love to attend that. And you said Achin Van Eyck, uh, previous guest of the podcast. Achin is, is, is the well. is the is the lodestone of all this. He's the one who anchors it and he's the one who Achin people don't know this, is a fantastically gifted comedian. So <laughs> in between sessions he has a, he's an endless repository of jokes. And we turned we found out he's something of an amateur magician. So he also provided the <laughs> entertainment in, uh, after. And I'll have to get him back on the podcast. Not to do magic because it doesn't work on podcast one. And two, I hate magic. But <laughs> for the comedy, maybe be able to do that. He's an uh, endless repository of jokes. Well, I mean, to kind of lead on to what we're actually going to talk about, I'm actually curious just to use that thread and pull at it. How do they respond to universalist and materialist arguments in India's context today? I mean, it's a school for Marxists. So the, the, our criterion is... Uh, you can't be somebody who's curious about Marxism or wants to debate Marxism because in four days you can't make progress with that. So the school is for people who see themselves as socialists, mm. who are involved in socialist organizing, uh, and who want to sharpen their theory. Now, when you have an audience like that, they're universalists by instinct because they're they're mobilizing around class concerns in a country that's extremely heterogeneous linguistically, mm. culturally, etc. In fact. We have to do it in English, the school, because if we did it in one of the Indian languages, only a third of the room would understand what's going on. Right. Yeah. So this is a country in which even language is uh, uh, is not consistent across the board. You cannot be a socialist in India without being a universalist. Now, it just so happens that socialism is on its deathbed in India, so mm. it's not saying much, much like here. Yeah. It's in full retreat. But the universalism, for anybody who considers himself a Marxist, it's not something uh, that's a challenge. Uh, and one of the tragedies of the current left is that one has to make an argument for universalism, which is a precondition to getting to anything useful at all. And yeah. we, we never get beyond these extraordinarily simple and obvious points on in the current left because the current left is yeah. so 
lacking in confidence and so decimating. Well, as you say, these are self-described Marxists and not perhaps maybe socialists, which can, you know, mean a whole range of different things and can indeed and has um, been victim of loads of seeping in of uh, yeah. of kind of particularist notions, yeah. for example. Um, so we're going to come on to that. We're going to mainly discuss your book, The Class okay. Matrix, uh, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn, which is a fantastic read and a fantastic argument, I think. Um, and for listeners, it came out in on Harvard University Press on the 8th of February. Um, and people should go out and buy it, definitely. Um, but we're also going to kind of set the scene, I guess, um, and put this in the context of Vivek's work as a whole. So, I mean, I think it may be one way of putting what your theoretical over is, is um, looking at the contradictions of modernity. Firstly, kind of on, it's in a more materialist, in, not materialist, because that is obvious, but in a kind of material sense, in terms of looking at development and the de developmental state, before passing on to kind of cultural thought, culturalist thought, um, and the realms of ideology. I mean, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, my... my um agenda turned out to be different from the way I envisioned it. I had a fairly clear idea of what I wanted to do when I entered graduate school, which was I wanted to develop uh, Marxist thought, but particularly in the context of the glo global south. And in particular, I'd wanted to work on the state because while there had been a flourishing of Marxist theory around the state in the advanced world, the understanding of the particular state forms in the global south was still very, very underdeveloped. And in the 90s, the, um, the springboard for discussing the state in the South was developmentalism and the role of development mm. state. So that became an obvious point for me to go through. And the, the more overarching motivation was to show that you need not have different theories, different sociologies, the global South and the North. You could have the same theory operating at different levels of generality, different levels of abstraction, mm. which is, of course, what Marxists took for granted since the Russian Revolution or even the 1905 Revolution, Lenin, Mao, Trotsky, Ho Chi Minh, whoever you want to look at, uh, Eduardo Modlane, none of them doubted the general salience and relevance of Marxism as it traveled from the north to the south. Mm -hmm. What they were trying to think about is how to go from the general to the particular, yeah. how, to go, it, how to operate different levels of abstraction. And that project had been advanced by the new left up to a certain point, but only up to a certain point. And I wanted to participate in the project of advancing it further. So the first book was an attempt to show that the developmental state was an instance of the bourgeois state. And insofar as it was, it was subject to the same constraints as the bourgeois state mm -hmm. writ large, which was not the norm in studying that form of the state uh, at the time. Once I did that, though, by the time the book came out, we were in the full bloom of post-colonial theory and the hegemony of post-colonial theory, the linchpin of which, the calling card of which, was to deny the possibility of a, a theory traveling across national borders because it was held yeah. meant on not only particularism, but what I thought was a very essentialist kind of way, mm -hmm. and indeed, I think, a kind of orientalist and soft racist way yeah. of understanding the South. So then I, was, I, I took, had to take a detour because by the early 2000s, the foundations for even asking and posing the questions that I was trying to pose had been stripped away by post-colonial theory. And since then, I've been involved in engaging first post-colonial theory and then the, what underlies it, which is this all-encompassing culturalism. Yeah. And that's what the new book is about. Yeah, and I guess in both cases, it's kind of a, a materialist response to, to culturalism. Um, and as we'll come on to talk about, obviously, uh, this is something that's seeped into kind of popular consciousness. It's, this isn't just a sort of, well, I'm fighting off my academic enemies. It's uh, taking on an actual live debate, but at a theoretical level. Yeah. Um, I guess beyond the sort of, you know, kind of highfalutin, terms and categories like post-colonialism or post-structuralism um, in the way that it's filtered down, who have you, who in specifically writing the class matrix, actually, who are you writing that against? Like, I, I assume like all good books, it's motivated by hate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, is it, was it like academic enemies you wanted to take on specifically, or was it, were you making an argument against something that you've observed in society or in politics? The, the post-colonial theory book was very much directed at individuals. because, And the reason it was directed at individuals is the typical response from the part of uh, culturalists uh, when, you, when you come up with a counter-argument is to deny the premise, which is to say, well, you've mistreated, you've misread us or you're misrepresenting us. And that part of the packaging of that 
trend was to in, uh, indulge and rely on a level of obscurantism which allows you to evade criticism because you say it, whatever you're saying, and then when somebody responds, you change the goalpost to say, mm. well, that's not what we meant. Now, anticipating that, I knew the only way I could actually make criticisms that stick is to engage particular arguments, particular people yeah. who are representative of the trend. And yeah, uh, hate, eh, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I wrote that book in a very angry state. The tone, I don't think, reflects it because I had to be quite serious yeah, and no, sober it, in the yeah. way I, I take it up. But I was criticizing people who I thought are professional bullshit artists. And <laughs> I don't have any doubt about that. Yeah. Now, this class matrix is more directed at a zeitgeist than it is at individuals. There, I take up arguments that by now I feel are part of the firmament, the intellectual culture, for which I sought out representatives. But I did not go out trying to find individuals to criticize. And the reason was the class matrix unfolds through an engagement with cultural theory, but it's not meant to be a response to culturalism per se, so much as an elaboration of what a materialist class theory is. And in the course of that elaboration, deal with um, predictable criticisms as they come up. Yeah. And so you'll find that the people who I take on, it's, it's the cast of characters is more diffuse. So there's um, Stuart Hall, who plays a very big role mm -hmm. in this. There's the ghost of E.P. Thompson. Yeah. Um, and there's Bill Sewell is an interesting figure because he was both one of the trailblazers of cultural history, but he's also one of the ones who, at, at a you know, at a certain stage, said this has gone too far. And in a period of globalizing capitalism that's crushing humanity under its weight, we're questioning whether capitalism even exists. And yeah. he said that's that's obviously a problematic stance. Sewell therefore oc occupies a kind of a uh, a dual uh, role in, in the book, um, so you'll see names come up, but it's not as directed. It's not. It's not wrapped around individuals the way the postcolonial theory was. Yeah, I, I was surprised, especially in the first three chapters, how analytical it is. Maybe I was expecting more of an intellectual history or a work of political theory, and it was. I mean, or at least a kind of historical view, and it's it's quite analytical. Let's actually get into the yeah, the, sure. the the what the book is about, and I think the big theme. Uh, as I read it, is you know class and its relation to stability versus conflict or a crisis in capitalism, and really looking back now, um, 175 years on from the 1848 revolutions, and going, hang on, actually, um, stability is the thing that needs more explaining rather than as the early Marxists saw it to explain crisis and how capitalism could and soon will be undermined or overthrown um and th i guess what the, the the main argument that you make is that stability doesn't need explaining through recourse to some ideological supplement by kind of reaching for new tools to say this is why people haven't risen up this is why the workers haven't overthrown capitalism but actually by extending that very theory of the early marxist um which is a really compelling argument um and actually goes against maybe some of my instincts actually, but uh, we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, as you say in, in the book, actually, because I think it's a neat formulation, classical Marxists didn't fail in their structural class theory. It's that they didn't fully theorize their own theory's implications. So talk yeah. us through that. Uh, let me just step back for a second, because you did a very nice job laying out the context. So let me uh, also uh, do that from my end, just to, so listeners understand what the puzzle is. M Marxism was always supposed to be a theory of the uh, contradictions of capitalism. And underneath it, or implied in it, was an expectation that these contradictions would sooner rather than later overwhelm capitalism. And the source of those contradictions was the class structure itself, because the exploitative relation between employers and employees, bosses and workers, was uh, so stark and so unrelenting that workers would take advantage of their structural position inside uh, capitalism, the fact that they're the ones who produce the profits, have had the, they're all together working as a unit, and they would exercise their power at the very least to dramatically push back the power of capital, but perhaps also to overthrow capital altogether. And for a long time, it looked like that was actually working. For about three to four decades, it looked like that process was unfolding from the early 1900s all the way right up to the Spanish Civil War, I would say. And that process comes to something like a halt by the 1950s. 
So the question became for Marxists, why did the what appeared to be a growing instability of capitalism suddenly morph into an abiding stability? What causes that? That became the puzzle. And because Marxists of the mid, at mid-century accepted the premise that what class structures um, do is to unleash the contradictions involved in class, they were trying to understand why the contradictions became muted. And they said, well, it can't be in the class structure itself. It has to be coming from outside the class structure. Now, what is the class structure in classical Marxism? It's the base. And there's this thing called the superstructure. So if the class structure is failing to undermine capitalism, we have to look at what is stabilizing it, and that is something outside the class structure. That's culture. That's ideology. So the whole, a whole strain of thought in, from the Frankfurt School onwards, which is, mid, uh, which is um, interwar, but then all the way through Stuart Hall, E.P. Thompson, Gramscianism, is premised on the idea that we need to explain why capitalism survives, and the source of the stability has to reside in culture and ideology. And then the lead motif of the new left in the 50s became the biggest weakness of Marxism is that it has underestimated the power of culture. Mm -hmm. And if you walk into any graduate department today yeah. <laughs> in social science and you say, show me your lefties, and you say to the leftist, tell me what's wrong with Marxism. Well, they'll say, yes, uh, white supremacy, misogyny, rape culture, but, but then sooner <laughs> or later they come to culture. It, it, the Marxists don't appreciate culture. So it became an orthodoxy in the left that the structure is the source of conflict and the, what's called the superstructure, which I don't like these terms, but, and I, yeah. I criticize them in the book, but let's just go by the, the, the language. The superstructure is the source of stability. So what I argue in the book is that that in fact actually is entirely incorrect, that the secret to capitalism is that the class structure underwrites its own stability. The class structure is what accounts for the enduring stability of capitalism, not ideology or culture. Ideology or culture shapes and adjusts itself to the demands of the class structure, mm -hmm. but it does not in any way override the imperative of the class structure as the cultural turn thought. Yeah, and I, the the kind of central or one of the central contradictions of capitalism explains that. So this dialectical this dialectic that you set up actually between, for example, atomization and collectivity, which capitalism does both. It throws workers together, but also divides the class up in various ways, whether atomized or because they have recourse to other identities, for example, yeah. um, and which can often be cross-class identities. And I thought that was really powerful in terms of bringing that back home to kind of the classical Marxist theory without recourse to these supplements, which are, yeah, ultimately kind of saying false consciousness. And I think it's, I think you n hit the nail on the head when you say all these ways of saying, hey, this is why the workers didn't rise up because, you know, they watch too much TV or they uh, are too affluent or what uh, various other forms. I mean, um, maybe kind of they watch TV is, is old hat now. That's like a kind of 70s argument. But, you know, um, they're on TikTok. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. See, there's a fundamental problem for the cultural turn. Uh, and I mean here the proponents, the earlier proponents, people like Hall, people like Thompson, which is that unlike bourgeois theorists, they accept Marx's description of the class structure. And that description is one that shows the class structure as bringing people together in very um, uh, exploitative relations where the workers at a phenomenological level, every day are experiencing their exploitation at the workplace through overwork, through bad pay, through being bossed around, through losing their autonomy. They accept that. And then they ask why the workers aren't doing something about it. Now, the problem is this. Once you accept this description of the class structure and you say they're not doing anything about it because of culture, you're essentially saying they're idiots. You're saying that they experience these horrible facets of their life, but somehow the sheer force of socialization, whether it's the church, whether it's the media, whether it's the family, blinds them to this process. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? Bourgeois theorists have a lot easier time dealing with this because they say, what exploitation? Yeah. A libertarian will say, look, it's gains from trade. It, both of them are benefiting. So you're very premised that there's exploitation. Yeah, or class on. doesn't even exist, for or example. Or it doesn't exist. So your premise is wrong. 
Yeah. The problem with the new left was it had no choice but to treat workers as dupes. Yeah. And this is its fundamental flaw. And it, it there was a fork in the road at a certain point. Either it had to say that our description of exploitation is wrong, or it had to say that our notion of false consciousness is wrong. And starting with the mid-80s, LaClauen, Mufa, and these people, they said the description of the structure is wrong. Yeah. They had to give up the structuralism, and that's what then paves the way for the post-structuralism. There was a small section of the structuralist left of which Eric Wright was the most brilliant proponent who said, no, the culturalism must be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's... Was, By the 90s, that's a tiny minority. Yeah, so as I said, I think that's very powerful. I think you always root this argument fundamentally in interests, right? And that people's material interests will be determining. Um, which The way I like to think about it is determining in the following sense. They form a center of gravity around which your actions and your ideas are going to orbit, which means that determinism makes it sound as if it's a one-to-one -one relation. And of yeah. course, you don't find that in social life in any domain. What you have to look at is centers of gravity in social life that keep, keep pulling people back to where they are. And um, material interests, it's sad that one has to make this case on the left. If you don't understand this, you're not on the left. Yeah. But if you give up the realization, and because, look, this is an observation, it's not an assertion. You look out in the world and people act on their interests. Fundamentally, in political life, they're act if you don't see that, you're not watching. Yeah. So you just have and, to assert And I, I, th I think like this kind of sort of, sort of preempts a question that I wanted to ask, which is that today, I mean, certainly on the left, to talk about interest is a little bit taboo. I mean, you might say, oh, corporations, blah, 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 blah. blah. But to say that, for example, people, ordinary people might nakedly pursue their own self-interest like it's seen as like no no if if we believe that they can truly be socialist and have class consciousness they don't do that you know like almost like it's buying into neoliberal ideology to believe that people might pursue their own interests at the expense of someone else and even though that's obvious something that happens right I, and, and not to say that that's the norm or that we should necessarily reify that or legitimize or whatever the point is is that it happens it's just the reality well it is the norm and here, here's the way I would put it there, there are two reasons why so-called left is suspicious of all this talk about interests. One is, as you're saying, there's this bizarre um, anxiety that only the right talks about interests. Yeah. And this whole tradition of talking about interests, whether it's a social contract theory and stemming from Rousseau, or whether all of it is now brought to a fine point in rational choice theory, which is what economists use, and economists justify capitalism and defend it. Therefore, if we're going to criticize the economists, we must abandon the foundational or reject the foundational premise of their mm -hmm. theory, which is rational choice theory. Yeah. Now, two things about this. First of all, it may be true, and it is true, that economists rely on rational choice theory, but that theory is not the only way of mobili mobilizing a, a materialist understanding of people's interests. There are different ways of understanding people being rational uh, other than simply the very narrow way that economists mm -hmm. do. If you want to criticize neoclassical economists, you don't do it by, by saying people aren't rational. Where they're wrong, the economists, is in their description of markets, not in the description of the agent. Now, and what's sad is that the, because the left abandoned its materialism, all the really interesting criticisms of rational choice theory have now come from within economics itself because <laughs> yeah. the left likes to talk about fashion and movies and things like that yeah. rather than talking about how people... Well, and economists have moved on because now they're behaviorists now. Exactly. So it's, exactly. You know. And frankly, what is called behavioral economics and the notions of bounded rationality and satisfying, that's exactly what Marxist materialism was. And it's, a, I think, it's considerable embarrassment that socialists and Marxists for whom... This is a foundational premise of their... If you give up on material, you cannot do politics. Yeah. And that's, of course, why the left gave up on it, because it doesn't do politics. It does movie criticism. Yeah. So, A, the th one of the things to realize is the, the misgivings and the anxieties come from a misplaced criticism of neoclassical economics. The second thing that they're worried about uh, is that you see workers doing things that don't seem to be in their interests like voting for Republicans, voting mm -hmm. for the Tories, etc. But I think the, there's some elementary confusions on this part. You have to ask yourself, when a worker is voting for a Republican or a Tory, typically, are they doing it with an indifference 
a conscious indifference to their perceived interests? Or are they doing it because this is what they think will advance their interests? Yeah. It is in it is absolutely without any doubt whatsoever that they do it because they they think this will advance their interests. And a thing which I think is also important is that there is not the level of investment broadly among in the working class in politics, in formal politics, that observers, specifically kind of left liberal professional class observers, have in politics, for whom their voting for the Democrat is their whole identity <laughs> or or large part of it. Um, whereas for workers, it might just be like, yeah, I went and voted for this guy because it seemed like whatever. He voted for Trump because, well, he said he's going to repeal NATO. You know, that's NATO, excuse me, <laughs> NAFTA. You know, um, here's what, something we have to, however, mm, what's the word, perhaps acknowledge or at least embrace. In the United States, at least, when you look at the last 30 years of polling and you ask Americans, and this is not class specific, this is general polls, which means it's underestimating what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. You ask Americans, what are your main concerns? They're always economic. Yeah. Always economic. So then why do they vote for Republicans who will hurt them economically? Obviously, it's not because they are not trying to advance their material interests because they just told you, my main concerns are my material interests. They're doing it because when you try to figure out how to defend your material interests, you have to rely on information that's not immediately available or accessible to you through your direct experience. You rely on information coming from experts. Who are the experts today who have access to American workers' consciousness? It is entirely the ruling class, entirely the ruling class, its media organs, and its intellectuals, who will then tell them, you want to defend your job? Close the borders. You want to create jobs? Cut taxes. Now, <laughs> How is a worker supposed to, somebody, academics don't understand it. All of cultural studies doesn't understand this. Why would somebody who's working at Walmart understand the ins and outs of these theories? So to look at them as having failed an exam, yeah, you're voting for the wrong party, therefore you must not be uh, interested in your material interest, is again, extraordinarily condescending. Yeah, they're I doing mean, the best they can with the information they have. And we, in and, pursuit and of we can add, and we can add that that sways the American working class doesn't vote. So yeah, half of them so. have actually <laughs> rationally given up and said, "Screw it," and exactly. rationally said, "Both of these parties are out to get me." I, I didn't mean to go down this road, but one last question on this question of interest, which. Mm-hmm. Again, it's maybe we're doing what you also didn't want to do, which is this thing. Oh, man, we're having to, like, go back to the basics. No, no, we must, because <laughs> we that's must, yeah. where the left is. The, exactly. the left has to be told the earth is not flat. So the, the thing about interest, I think in certainly at the kind of end of history, and maybe we're you know moving out of that. Um, certainly that's our contention in the podcast. But during the end of history, the ideology of consensus was the predominant one and of technocracy finding the 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 right solutions to to problems which are already predetermined in that world interests aren't expressed nakedly it's a very different world to the past so capitalists don't nakedly say i'm gonna get all the money i mean you know greed is good it's a caricature of like the 80s um and maybe that was the the reality then i was just a the barely old barely alive or you know whatever um maybe that was the case then but certainly through the 90s and 2000s after the bourgeoisie had defeated its class enemy there's there isn't really much naked expression of of class interest and certainly amongst like the leading sections of capital and in the culture you don't really have that very much no and, and so I think that's also why people have theoretically or even just kind of tacitly in their kind of, you know, pop theorization of the world gone. Yeah, no interests aren't like a, a thing. Well, aren't there, there's aren't a difference, major... Alex, between the, the dominant ideology and how it presents and perceives the world. And then what we expect to find or hope to find within the self-styled left And we have to distinguish these two things. Mm. So if the question we're asking is why in dominant culture is interest talk disappearing, it's for the reasons that you say. You know, Adam Jaworski once said this in one of his earlier essays, and he's 100% right. He says, the only time talk of class, interests, exploitation, etc. makes it into the dominant culture is when the working class imposes it in there. Because when the right is ascendant, it will never talk about interests. It'll never talk about Mm -hmm. class because to it... The end of history ideology is the natural ideology for it and to its intellectual servants as well, for whom interests just aren't part of the picture. The question you well, want to And, I and in an earlier phase, excuse me, but like yeah. in an earlier phase of capitalism, religion was the dominant yes. ideology, yeah. various religious forms, and there also interests aren't, uh, aren't foregrounded. No, it's duty. Exactly. In religion, it's duty. And in bourgeois ideology in the late 20th century, it was, as you're saying, it was consensus, uh, it was a Tina. No alternative, deal with it. 
that it was the linchpin of supply side economics that we all share in the bounty when the economy is growing. So let's do our bit for the economy to grow. What has been puzzling for people like us and people on the left is how did socialists or radicals or the left start to question the salience of interest? Because as Jaworski says, if it's the left that brings interest back into political discourse because the working class has to organize around its interests, which means it has to recognize what its interests are. If it's the left that brings it into the culture, if the left is now at the forefront of denying the salience of interests, then you have to find a different word for that formation. It's not a left anymore. It's something else. And so the puzzle is not so much about why in the popular culture interest talk disappeared. It's why within the left it disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very important. Now, to return to something which I already highlighted in the introduction to, to your book, <laughs> when I introduced your book, but better put, um, <laughs> uh, the absence of class consciousness is the norm rather than the exception. And this is something that becomes quite obvious looking in hindsight uh, at the last 170, 50, 175 years since the 1848 revolutions. Um, one of the contentions in your argument, in, in your argument uh, in, throughout the book is that rather than collective forms of resistance uh, or indeed revolution uh, there's individualized forms that are um, often that are inscribed in the structure of capitalism yeah the, the secret to capitalism is not that it uh, it gets rid of the antagonism between class actors it's that it channels the resistance of from the part of the workers into individualized forms of resistance rather than collective and that's the whole secret to why the class structure underwrites its own stability yeah, and that's a much more convincing argument rather than having recourse to false consciousness. Yeah. People were blinded. Right. Um, but there's another possibility as well, which is resignation and cynicism, where there isn't individual forms of It's not of so much a possibility as the eventuality. Yeah. So my argument is that... I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. No, go, no, perfect. The argument is that once workers find it more attractive on rational grounds to avoid collective action because of all the risks involved in it, they are now consigning themselves to confronting their employer individually and to resisting individually. But the moment you embrace individual resistance, you are also embracing your position in the class structure because you can individual resistance can generate at best mobility for an individual from one position in the class structure to another, but it doesn't ever alter the rules of the class structure. And for most workers, the overwhelming majority, they can't even get the individual mobility. All they'll get is a survival of some kinds, which means you're essentially abiding by the rules of the class structure. And that's the beauty of the system, as it were, the, the perverse beauty. It makes collective action prohibitively costly, prohibitively risky, so that workers adopt resistance through individual means. But by doing that, they also stabilize mm -hmm. the, the very same class structure on rational grounds without being dupes without being fools without being it's a radically different argument to say you know this is manufactured consent for yeah. example yeah. but you know and you, that's resignation they have to resign themselves what marx called the dull compulsion of economic relations the dull compulsion of their situation their class situation induces them to resign to their place in the class structure rather than consent to it in the way that the cultural mavens and the new left thoughts are Okay, so this error of you know effectively relying on a false consciousness argument rather than seeing that capitalism underwrites its own stability um, through the kind of disaggregating factors of breaking up the possibilities for class formation effectively. Um, let's do some intellectual history then, yeah. I guess. When did where did this error come in? I mean, do you see that the early Marxists? Is it the new left specifically who which is responsible? I do think the early Frankfurt School. Uh, the dialectic of, Enli of enlightenment, it doesn't come out and say it explicitly so much, but it's hard to understand what the purpose of that book is uh, if it's not to explain workers' inability to understand their situation. Adorno's early work on the media and the media industry, and even though I think that Marcuse's One Dimensional Man is basically a materialist book, uh, it very it becomes so pessimistic about workers breaking out of their hook being hooked into patterns of consumption etc that it endows the culture industry and the media with a power 
that it ought not to have. So I would say the Frankfurt School is, a, is definitely a place where it starts out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, you don't take my word for it. I have these long quotes from Stuart Hall. You know, Hall's an interesting figure. He was a pivotal agent in the new left and, of course, pivotal in the turn towards culture. But he didn't partake of many of its um, neuroses and many of its pathologies. He always remained a clear writer. He always tried to be a clear thinker. And so he's a very good entree into that, into mm -hmm. that formation. Hall says it quite explicitly that in the early 50s, when they're founding the Center for Cultural Studies at Birmingham, when they're setting up the universities and left review and all that, they were convinced that the, the secret to stability resides in culture and that the emphasis on the material situation of the working class was a liability in mm. that it, it, it d detracted attention from all of these cultural forms. So the new left gets it going where it reaches its fine point, where it's real, um, how do you pronounce the word, apogee? <laughs> yeah, apogee, apogee. <laughs> yeah. Is in the particular variant of Gramsci that's mobilized from the 70s onward. Now, as I say in the book, I think it's a quite colossal misreading of the prison notebooks to present Gramsci as a culture maven. But by the early 80s, it's over, and that's what it becomes. So the new left is the torchbearer for this, but it's not the originator. I mean, <laughs> this is a silly aside, but provoked by your book, um, which is always a good reminder of how bad Gramscians are relative to Gramsci, um, and probably one of the worst cases of that. But, you know, Gramsci was so brilliant that uh, his own disfigurement, being a hunchback, prefigured his disfigurement by Gramscians later on. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to you could. And it's quite astonishing. You read the prison notebooks. It's just impossible, just impossible, in my view, to come out of it thinking he's a culturalist. It, mm. he, not only is he not, are the key passages in the prison notebooks, not advocating for a cultural turn, when Gramsci comes to the key questions of bourgeois stability, of ruling class power, he reminds himself and the reader, let's go back to Marx's preface of the 1859 contribution to critique of political economy and reminds ourselves that we are rock-ribbed, not just materialists, technological determinists. How it just shows you how powerful the zeitgeist is that people go into those notebooks. Essentially, they go quote hunting. Yeah. They find the quotes that'll fit into the narrative they want to establish, and they turn Gramsci around. I think it's quite impossible to come out with that. Reading. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, one seeming lacuna in the book, which I mean struck me, is that you know, it's obviously not historic. It's an analytical argument more than it is an yeah. obviously historical one. Um, but there are plenty of historical references that go from Marx and the early Marxists to, through to the generation of Lenin and, and, and of Gramsci, and then to the New Left through to today. And, and you know, I guess we were still living in the New Left's world in some ways. Um, the degenerate phase. The, de the most new degenerate left. phase, and it's important to kill it uh, <laughs> rather than just leave it behind. Right. But I, I fear we might just leave it behind rather than kill it. But anyway, that's maybe a, another discussion. What I found absent was the role of Stalinism and in its role in the degeneration of Marxism, because you know there's nothing there from like 35 to to to, to you know 60. So. Is there a reason for that? I mean, or do you think uh, it wasn't yeah. it germane to your argument? For or? this particular malady in the intellectual culture, which is culturalism, I don't think Stalinism was a, a really an important factor. It was in the background. It was in the background in that the conviction to reject what the Hall and his generation thought was a mechanical Marxism, that conviction is hardened because they associate mechanical Marxism with Stalin and Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to, if one were to tell an intellectual history of this this um, the, uh, of this intellectual uh, formation, I think it would have to be in there. The, the, the book, I, I always avoid intellectual writing, intellectual histories. My in my books, the historical facts about intellectual development come up here and there. The reason I avoid intellectual hi histories is inevitably it takes you down the path of Marxology or Gramsciology or something where people will fixate on your interpretation of the thinker rather than your explanation of events or mm. processes. And I very much firmly, firmly believe that Marxism is a social science and that it has to be an ongoing research program where we draw on thinkers but don't get drawn into debates about the thinkers and their thoughts. Really, who gives a shit? I, honestly, it doesn't matter if Gramsci was a culturalist or not. It doesn't matter if Marx was a determinist or not. The point is, just like physicists don't sit around debating whether Newton 
was actually religious or not. Marxist socialists shouldn't sit around debating the content of Marxist thought. It should only be about their ideas. Mm. So if I were writing the intellectual history, I would have put that in there, as you're saying. But my concern was to explain two things. Why does capitalism survive? And why do so many thinkers wrongly uh, explain that stability? Mm -hmm. For which I had to then draw on these culturalists because they're influential. But why the culturalists came to believe what they did biographically was less of a concern. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I suspect that it was the weaknesses um, already built in by Stalinism in terms of, for example, the rigidity of its base superstructure model. Not just model, Stalin, Alex. It... Look at Engels. The main culprit here is Engels. In, w- one of the worst formulations in the history of Marxism is Engels saying, we believe as Marxists that the base determines a superstructure, but in some instances, the superstructure can react back on the base. Okay, two points here. One is, the superstructure must always be reacting back on the base if the point of the superstructure is to functionally stabilize the base. This was Jerry Cohen's argument in Marx's theory of history, and he's 100% right about that. So to say that it sometimes reacts back on the base means it's basically a waste of time to build a superstructure. Secondly, it turns the theory into a tautology. Because if the theory is saying that there's a determinism between the base and everything else, it's saying that the direction of causation goes from the base to the other stuff. But then you'll find instances where it seems like the other stuff, culture, ideology, etc., is either A operating independently of the base or seems to be it's shaping economic relations itself now for any respectable theory that should be considered considered at least an anomaly or perhaps a reason to worry that the theory is wrong but Ingalls gives them an out that says no sometimes the superstructure reacts back on the base which basically means anytime you find an instance that seems to contradict the theory you have an out which is no this is one of those instances when the superstructure is reacting back on the base which turns the theory into a tautology. It becomes unfalsifiable. The problem with that then was instead of thinking that the, pro- that the, the entire formulation of base and superstructure as inhabiting different spheres of reality is highly misleading and problematic, which they would have thought if they seriously considered that these instances which seem to be c- contradicting the theory are in fact contradicting the theory and we need to change the theory's formulation Instead, they relied on this out, on this circularity. And but isn't Stalin that dialectics? Built... <laughs> well, I mean, now, I think you're triggering me here. <laughs> because uh, you probably know that I, I don't have a high opinion of dialectics and things like that. If all dialectics means that things interact, yes, but that doesn't solve the problem. Because in all claims about interaction, we have to know, is the interaction symmetrical or asymmetrical? If it's asymmetrical, you have to ask, why is it asymmetrical in this particular way. Mm. What gives one node of the causal relation more power than the other node? So what I do in this book is to say that, in your language, it is totally dialectical how consciousness and culture react to people's class position in that they adjust their consciousness to their class position. Well, they're adjusting it because the consciousness matters because it's what allows you to motivate yourself and fit into the class structure. That means it's reacting back on you. Mm -hmm. But it's asymmetrical in that it's having to adjust itself to your class position, which means A is determining B. Yeah. I'd love to continue this, but we're going <laughs> to have to do this another time um, because I, I wanted to come on to the role of ideology just a little bit briefly. Yeah. Um, it's an area of Marxist and Marx-adjacent thought that has been most developed in over the past decades, um, often very badly. But I think there's some brilliant stuff in there yes. as well. Yes. Um, and you're very clear. I think it's it's very neat. Ideology serves as rationalization, not as causation. Right. So it doesn't not as co- motivation. Not yeah. as motivation, right. It doesn't make people rise up or not rise up. It uh, is a way through which they explain their material Yeah, situation. the way I would put it is it isn't what um, generates the decisions for what people do. What generates the decisions is a rational calculation of their choices. It, it's what allows them to live with their decisions. Yeah. That's the, and that's how it's a rationalization. So kind of bring it to kind of contemporary discussion about where we are. It strikes me that contemporary ideology, firstly, has very little to say about freedom. Um, it doesn't hold up, you know, it, you don't even, you, even the kind of thin neoliberal freedom that you had before is no longer held up by the ruling class. So there's not even a, 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 a hook kind of and to, to, or to hold them to account for their unfulfilled promises of freedom it's been somewhat I think largely abandoned 
Um, and that popularly, we hold a very contradictory attitude. I mean, if I'm reading contemporary ideology correctly, hold a very contradictory attitude to it in which we accept all sorts of domination and humiliation and indignities. But we still hold uh, that freedom is sort of the absence of constraints at all, right? So that the purely self-determining subject. And you can do that in your own head, which is why people find debate so um, alienating. Um, and atrocious today because people think, no, you're imposing your views on me. Like that's somehow an offense, but you accept all sorts of other indignities um, and constraints imposed by capital, by the state, etc. Um, and so, you know, we effectively we end up locating the, the absence of freedom or the abrogation of freedom in the interpersonal. You know, people brushing up against me is, is the problem, is the limitation to my freedom and not the fact that, for example, I have to I have no choice but to go out and work for a living and that I have very little say over the conditions of that work or of my life. And I think that is a very difficult situation to try to resolve because you don't even have the foundation of freedom that you have in the period following, I guess, from the French Revolution, even up in the dying days of neoliberalism somehow. Well, no, sorry, not the, the early days of neoliberalism. We're in the dying days of neoliberalism. Um so I think that that's another one of these fundamentals that has been lost. Um, I winding my way to a question here. Um, maybe I just maybe referring to the book. How, how, explain your argument about the need for constraints. That freedom is not just the absence of all constraints. Um, I think you've raised two questions here, and let me address both. One is what's hap- happening to our notions of freedom ideologically today. And the other is, how should we conceptualize freedoms? And perhaps it should not simply be this um, Republican conceptualization, which is the absence of constraints or something like that. Um, So I think they're both very good points. With regard to the first, I I think that it is true that our conception of freedom is today quite different from what it was two generations ago. And there's very obvious why, which is... (laughs) It is not yet sufficiently appreciated how much bourgeois society and bourgeois culture was civilized by the socialists and by the labor movement, and by extension, how much liberal ideology and liberalism was civilized by them. If you look at the history of liberalism when it's born, you can see it going through three phases. One is the early phase from, say, the 1820s or 30s onward after the French Revolution, all the way up till the 1850s and 60s, in which liberalism is very much a kind of Uh, ideology of a petty bourgeoisie and sections of capital but it's it's been overemphasized how much it's capital that's pushing liberalism it's really the professional classes and and what the what we call the old middle class then there's the birth of the left and then there's the death of the left let's say by 1980 and the post 1980 liberalism Mm -hmm. and i've been struck by something which is that post 1980s liberalism has a lot of affinities with pre-1850 liberalism, which is that it's really much more attached to the professional ambitions and the worldview of the stratum of the intelligentsia, which it is it's a very mercenary ideology. The, what we are seeing in ideology today is two things. One is that, as you say, we naturalize the parts of our experiences in the class structure which are built into it and which we're powerless against, which is the daily humiliation of going to work, of the necessity of doing it, the precarity of our work, etc. And we then try to affect or fight around the parts of our lives that we think are actually negotiable, which are fewer and fewer and fewer in this phase of capitalism because capital has taken over so much of our lives, our daily existence. And so it becomes an obsession with marginal aspects of our lives. The second point about that is there's a reason. That is accompanied with what I think is a a form of tribalism that I've never seen in my life, ideologically, in which right now bourgeois culture, the ideological debates within it are debates around uh, the needs and aspirations of particular tribes, not classes, but tribes, racial tribes, gender tribes, ethnic Mm -hmm. tribes, etc., all of which are being represented by the professional classes, not by class act, not by the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, but by these professional classes mm-hmm. who have taken over a discourse in which there used to be labor unions and socialists and left liberals, etc. That's all gone now. 
the reason why I think you have this tribalism is that to this stratum that is waging these ideological wars, it sees an opportunity for itself to grab a bigger slice of the pie, not for its tribe, but for that stratum of the tribe. Yeah. It's a kind of narrow nationalism in which black politicos are not trying to get more for blacks, but for black politicos. For where professional women are not speaking for women, but for professionals who happen to be women. This is a direct consequence of the narrowing of our vistas that has come with neoliberalism. And since the only people who have entree into the public discourse now are politicians, intellectuals, journalists, etc., they dominate the, that discourse and their ideology is a vicious professional ideology and mm. nothing more. Um, yeah, we actually did a recent episode comparing, well, it was actually talking to our friend Carl Sharrow about an essay he'd written about, comparing Western multiculturalism and identity politics to the Lebanese confessional system that he's more familiar with. And there as well, you know, it's the, the, the representatives of these kind of factional or confessional groups who um, try to extend their power. But I'm, I was struck by you, you saying that today's or the post-1980 liberalism in somehow is is similar to pre-1850 liberalism because that pre-1850 liberalism was um, a strong argument for freedom even if it was a freedom of kind of bourgeois liberties well, and that. expanding that that realm of possibility whereas today it doesn't seem to me you know it's a very illiberal liberalism which doesn't really expand the realm of freedom against the old aristocracy, for example, which is now gone. Um, and it's not really as against the bourgeoisie today that the professional managerial class is fighting against. It's really just a narrow defense of its own positioning. Well, that's what that's what 1830s liberalism was. It wasn't arguing... 1830s liberals were quite clear that the rights that they're fighting for are, are not to be extended to workers. That's, yeah, but I guess there's a cunning of history, at least insofar as their fights with the, the Ancien Regime um, were... They were entirely of about extending the... about uh, removing the obstacles to upward mobility. And insofar as they wanted to speech rights for themselves, it was because those speech was necessary to fight for their narrow rights. This is from the French Revolution all the way on. The, the liberal intelligentsia did not become a advocate for freedoms as we would recognize it until the socialists and the left forced it to do so or brought some mm -hmm. of them to their side. What are the well, right now, what how is identity politics being articulated? The anti racism, the anti sexism, etc. It's not to increase the life chances for the vast majority of women, for the vast majority of blacks or Latinos. It's to decrease the obstacles for upward mobility for the professional classes within yeah. them within and this is a, I want to write something about this soon about how identity politics has changed from the 90s to now identity politics today is lined up squarely against redistribution you didn't see this in the 90s mm -hmm. in the 90s it was like the idea was well we can't have redistribution so let's have affirmative action so it was the left edge of the possible what Sanders did was Sanders forced everybody to show their cards. And it's a remarkable development that since 2016, identity politics is defining itself as being opposed to what it calls universalism, mm -hmm. race blindness. Gender. That's all another way of saying redistribution. This is no less narrow than the liberals of the 1840s who were saying, keep the property demand on the franchise but extend us our liberties to debate and discuss and take away the the sinecures and the purchasing of offices mm. that the nobles and the aristocrats have so that we can get into those offices. Mm -hmm. What is today, what is anti-racism today? It's diversity training and ha opening up Harvard for people of color. Harvard, not community colleges. Harvard. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, that's all very interesting. Um I'm not going to pursue that further because there's, I've got other things on the agenda, all right. but that's, that's, that's all great stuff. So actually, let, let's just quickly return to the other conception of freedom. Yeah, this is a really good point you make. And I think socialists need to work on this a lot more. 
we have, you know, the early socialists were very clear that uh, socialism is not simply the removal of constraints so that people might pursue whatever ends they want, but it brings with it some obligations to the community as well. And that, I partly because I think that claim was jumped upon by Stalinists and turned into a demand for altruism and self-sacrifice, mm. socialists have been hesitant to bring that up again. But I don't think it's possible to have a viable socialism without a sense of community and a sense of, therefore, belonging and obligation to that community. So our freedom, therefore, has to be conceptualized as part of a social nexus, as bringing with it a social, a series of commitments to the wider uh, population and to the cause, which is disciplined by a healthy understanding of what the limits of those obligations are. So, And interestingly, it's not just the Stalinists who we have to ward off here, it's also the contemporary forms of liberalism. You know, the, one of the worst slogans the left ever came up with was that the personal is political. Yeah. Because it meant that it's everybody's business, your business becomes everybody's business. Of course, it was coming from the, a good place, which is to say you can't take domestic abuse and the horrible condi conditions in the family as a private matter and not s subject them to some sort of debate or protections for the victims. But it's turned into this kind of n insane hyper-politics where now if I, anything I say or utter in private is made a public concern. If I did it 20 years ago, I'm going to be fired today. And this is all considered social justice. So we have to defend the private sphere, not just from the Stalinists, but also from these insane progressives, what's mistakenly called progressives. Yeah, and I think it's one of these things that there's actually several cases of this where what began as an intra-left critique of, for example, men being macho and left-wing organizations and to say that, yes, the personal is political, becomes exploded on as to, to, to society as a whole as a sort of general vision that the private sphere is somehow completely, but completely indistinct and should be collapsed into the public. And, and it's exclusively and a domain of oppression and domination. Yes. So whereas, you know, the, the positive thing about liberalism was that it fought for these personal liberties against the state. Now it's taken as a license for the state to intrude into everything. Absolutely. But we shouldn't allow that to extrude the, the clear point that freedom is not simply saying, I want to do whatever the hell I want to do. It's also having a sense of, up. and <laughs> the sad thing is, for most people not on the left, this is obvious. And one reason they hate the left is because they think the left is against mm -hmm. community and family and social obligation. And it's, it's these crazed kids with purple hair who come in and say, I want to do whatever the hell I want to do. And I don't think it's that hard to work this into the conversation. But as with everything, the left first, instead of being a beacon of light on these things, it's where you've got to achieve some sort of clarity because of all the... Yeah, and, and why a lot of populists, and we're going to come on to this in just a second, but a lot of kind of populist insurrections might, you know, have placards saying, you know, we're, we're fighting against communism, we're fighting against socialism. And what they really mean is that they're fighting against capitalism today, um, well, or at least certain against... aspects of it. But it's, uh, well, I, I, I just yeah. want to say that we'll come back to yeah. this. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to foreshadow that. But um, yeah, I mean, actually, just just one thing on, on, the, on the freedom question. I think one of the neatest formulations, I think, is that freedom is not to be free from determination, but to choose your determination. Exactly. Um, and I think that's the, the right way to see it. Um, about identity politics and about other forms of collectivity, essentialist and particularist ones. Um, which is obviously something you deal with in your critiques of uh, post-colonial thought. Um, but I think it, it seeps into your argument of the class matrix in a, in a really interesting way, which is that uh, if collective workers' organization doesn't exist, class-based organizations don't arise, or that um, they don't pre-exist the worker entering the workplace, uh, that workers will rely on informal networks of other bases, of kin, caste, ethnicity, and so on. Uh, and there's a nice quote. It, it, it's an interesting irony, or rather, it's an irony of bourgeois society that far from dissolving these extra market ties, its, press, its pressures incline workers to cling to them with a desperate ferocity. I think it's nicely put. Um, but I think you could probably... It's funny, Eric Wright had zeroed on the very same passage and oh, yeah. <laughs> it said he liked the passage. Uh, very good. Um, so, I mean, good company. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, and I think probably could extend this further, which is that capitalism not just or forces workers to depend on these things, but in very many cases recreates these or and, and things that 
people see as the legacies of the old and something that we can cling on to or things that have been repackaged and repurposed by capitalism. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, th there is this kind of um, pop version of Marx on the manifesto when he says all that solid melts into air and all social ties are dissolved and, uh, and these sorts of things. And by and large, that's true. It, it's true in the sense that capitalism is indifferent to social ties. It is happy to sustain them when they serve profitability, but it's also committed to dissolving them when they get in the way of the accumulation process. It's indifferent to them, but indifference leaves open the possibility that it will not only tolerate them, but also sustain them. And it's been, we've been slow in coming to this realization and the cultural turn has been a big hindrance because when we see workers moving towards these and embracing these ties, this discourse on the left recently that workers are intrinsically sexist or intrinsically uh, racist or ethnocentric, etc., takes us to away from investigating the material roots and the material sources of their embrace of these social identities and instead uh, in, 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 um, endows those identities with a kind of a permanence mm. and, and autonomy that they simply don't have. And once again, it... it Li gives us license to reject working within that milieu into organizing it because they fail the test. They're not good enough for us. Yeah. And, you know, as Brecht said, once we've elected a new people, uh, then we'll, yeah. th we'll say that they're worthy of our organizing. Yeah. Them. No, I, I think a, most, a lot of left disposition today is radicalism against the masses. It's a way to... Uh, well, instead of like épater le bourgeois, it's épater the like, <laughs> you know uh, your neighbor. Um, the masses have the let masses. you down once again. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's move on to contemporary politics more deliberately. Okay, that's the end of this free episode. In the rest of this conversation with Vivek Chibber, we look at nostalgia for the post-war era among both left populists and right populists, and whether there's any going back. We question whether the populist wave is best seen as working class rebellion, whether the end of collective social organizations opens the space for us to be more directly political. And finally, I ask Vivek what the legacy of postmodernism is, and we complain that the left can't accept that it has won on culture. For all that, plus the after party where Phil, George and I debate these questions further, you'll have to subscribe at patreon.com slash bungacast. We hope to see you there. Thanks for listening. Follow BungaCast on social media. We're at BungaCast everywhere. Drop us a review if you enjoy this. And uh, that's it for now. Catch you later. Bye-bye.